uh, like that. Can you hear me? Can, can you ask the roommate if they can hear you? Without using this one. Oh, without using that yeah. one. Hello. Hello, everybody. People online, can you hear me well? It's coming from there. Yeah. OK. Then I had a very fancy introduction of you, Gabriel. But everybody knows who you are. Take the show here. OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much, Annette. It's such a, such a pleasure to be, to be here. And, to see many uh, familiar uh, faces. I, I hope you had a great uh, conference. Um, and so I'm very happy to, uh, to talk today about the, the main findings of the Global Tax Evasion Report that we released a couple of days ago. Um, so what we try to do in, in this report is to take uh, a global perspective on the uh, uh, progress, the successes, and also the failures of the fight against uh, tax evasion. So, you know, this issue has been very high on the policy agenda over the last 10, 15 years. And there's a number of ambitious policy initiatives that have been implemented, like the automatic exchange of bank information, like uh, a global minimum tax for multinational companies. And sometimes it's a bit difficult to know um, what, what works, what doesn't work. You know, policymakers sometimes are quick to make grandiose uh, uh, proclamations about the end of tax havens or things like that. And so what we try to do in the report is to uh, basically summarize the state of knowledge about the uh, effectiveness of these uh, various policies and also to set an agenda for the future. You know, what remains to be done if we want to make additional progress in uh, the fight against tax evasion. And so the report was prepared by the staff of the, of the EU Tax Observatory, uh, coordinated by, uh, by Annette uh, and Sarah, who's here, uh, and uh, Panos, Nicolaides, and myself. There's a foreword by Joe Stiglitz. But what I want to emphasize is that it rebuilds really on a lot of research, a lot of, some of it conducted by uh, the staff of the uh, EU Tax Observatory, but also a lot of research conducted by uh, other researchers globally working on these issues. And as uh, Annette uh, mentioned, um, uh, the, uh, a lot of the country level estimates of offshore wealth, of profit shifting in particular, uh, are available online on the Atlas of the uh, Offshore World. Uh, yes, Atlas of the Offshore World. <laughs> uh, Perhaps at the outset, it's worth discussing a little bit what's the kind of ultimate objective of all of that, you know, as I, as I see it. And uh, we think that fundamentally there is a need for uh, a, an equivalent of the IPCC, but for taxation. So you all know the IPCC. And so we think that uh, just like there is the IPCC for climate change, uh, it's important to have an independent group of experts um, that would uh, 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 be able to assess the reality of the uh, progress made against tax evasion, the dynamic of global tax evasion, the dynamic of uh, financial opacity, uh, the dynamic of international tax competition, and that would do that from a truly global perspective. And why is such a global perspective important? A global perspective is essential because if you take strictly a, a national perspective, from a national point of view, it can pay off to uh, uh, play the, the game of tax competition, to become a tax haven of sort, you know, to offer incentives to specific uh, companies or, uh, or certain groups of the population so as to attract a bit of activity, a bit of employment, a bit of tax revenue. And essentially, all countries have been tempting, tempted to do that. Some more than others, you know, smaller countries have been tempted more than others, maybe because the gains for them are potentially bigger. But you know, in a globalized world, uh, pretty much all countries uh, have uh, become tax havens of sort. And in the short run, at least, it, it can pay off. You know, there, there are real tangible benefits. But from a global perspective, all of that is, uh, is zero sum. And in fact, it's worse than zero sum. It's negative sum because the main beneficiaries of these uh, uh, tax incentives are, uh, tend to be high income and high wealth individuals, 
shareholders of multinational companies in particular who are towards the top of the income and the top of the wealth distribution. And so all of this fuels inequality, okay? And so that's why if you want to understand the sustainability of our tax systems, it's very important to take that global perspective. And so that's why fundamentally we need there, we think there is this need for an IPCC for taxation. And the other reason is just like the IPCC, uh, in addition to summarizing frontier research as we try to do in this report, also presents scenarios for future evolution uh, depending on the choices that we make to fight against climate change. We think that it's also a way that economies can be useful. Economies can be useful by explaining the variety of possible future policy uh, of possible you know possible futures, uh, depending on the choices that we make as interconnected nations. You know the choice to coordinate our tax policies, or the choice to encourage tax competition, for instance, or the choice to tolerate. Uh, financial opacity or the choice to create financial transparency. Okay, so towards the end of the report, we have a chapter that's about policies. The point is not to say, okay, this is what should be done. This is the ideal or the optimal policy, but more just to showcase the variety and the diversity of possible uh, uh, futures and their uh, concrete implications for tax revenues, for inequality, and so on. So that's the long-term goal, and so we think this report is one very modest step in that uh, evolution. And certainly for us, the big next step is going to, to try to move toward that, the, the creation of this new organization, an, an IPCC for uh, taxation. All right, so no, that being said, um, there are a number of findings in the report, and the way that we summarize that is it's, uh, it's like in the movie, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So there are now some uh, uh, real successes that are worth celebrating, and I'm going to start with that. And then uh, there are disappointments and, and a lack of progress on some key issues. That's the bad, and then there's the ugly, there's some stuff, especially involving the taxation of very wealthy individuals, where there's been no progress whatsoever so far. Okay, so let's start with the good. The good is that one specific form of tax evasion, which is offshore uh, tax evasion, the concealment of wealth uh, in tax havens, has declined significantly since 2016, 2017, thanks to the uh, automatic exchange of bank information. So I'm sure all of you or most of you are familiar with, with all of that. And uh, let me just uh, summarize very briefly the, 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 the context and the facts. 10, 15 years ago, it was really easy for people to hide assets uh, in tax havens because there was a complete or quasi-complete bank secrecy. Okay, There's a lot of evidence. We've done a lot of work with uh, Annette in particular, but many of you in, in this room have done research on that topic. That, that there's a lot of evidence that offshore tax evasion uh, was uh, a significant issue and was strongly concentrated towards the top of the wealth distribution. That offshore wealth uh, is a very concentrated form of uh, wealth. Uh, the regulatory context changed dramatically in 2016, 2017, when uh, more than 100 countries started implementing the common reporting standard, which is the automatic exchange of uh, bank information. And I should stress at the outset that you know, we, we know quite little about the effectiveness of that policy. There's really a critical lack of uh, data and public statistics on that issue. So most strikingly, essentially no country, or almost no country, a few exceptions, but very few, uh, almost no country publishes any data whatsoever on, uh, on the CRS, on how much wealth is being reported through the CRS. And tax havens themselves, they don't disclose any statistics on uh, what, what information they, they, they send to, uh, to foreign tax authorities. There's just a, you know, it's just all very, very opaque. And so we have to be careful in particular uh, with uh, 
uh, the, the, the evidence that exists. I don't think it's, it's comprehensive. There is a need for much more research in that area. That being said, it's pretty clear that uh, there is a, a lot of wealth which used to be hidden that now is being captured by the common reporting standard. We know that because we know, according to the OECD, that there's about 11, 12 trillion uh, euros uh, in, uh, in, in, in wealth uh, in 2022 that was reported through the CRS, okay? Uh, we also know from the, uh, from the literature on tax evasion that third-party reporting is, it really has a major effect on tax evasion. So when there is no third party reporting of information, like it was the case uh, for, uh, for offshore assets until 2016, 2017, then tax evasion tends to be, to be large, to be very high for, off, for offshore wealth. Uh, the available evidence suggests that almost uh, about 90% of offshore wealth evaded taxation before the automatic exchange of bank information. Now, lots of studies that show that, you know, for self-employment income, uh, when it's not third party reported, it can be, you know, 50% of income that evades uh, taxation. And vice versa, when there is third party reporting of information, uh, uh, like uh, for wage income in, in, in all, all or almost all countries or retirement income, and so on, tax evasion is just very low, not necessarily exactly zero, but more like five, 10%. So the fact that there is now this uh, a very sophisticated form of information uh, exchange and information reporting that captures a, a huge amount of wealth uh, suggests that tax evasion through unreported uh, offshore uh, bank accounts has declined significantly. We propose a number of scenarios in the report, and I emphasize again, you know, the uncertainties, and I think we try to be quite transparent about that in the in in the in the re, in the report. But uh, we propose, based on the available evidence. A number of scenarios and in our central scenario what we uh, estimate is that um, is historically that was perhaps about the equivalent of 10 percent of of world gdp in in wealth that was hidden that was held offshore and unreported and today this might be down to about three four percent of world gdp so it's not zero so it's much less than 10 first of all it's a big progress and that progress is important because it shows that you know, tax evasion is not some kind of law of nature. You know, sometimes people have the feeling that tax evasion, especially sophisticated forms of evasion involving wealthy individuals, powerful economic actors, is something that you know, cannot do anything about. And I, this example of the automatic exchange of bank information shows that this view is, is just wrong, that sometimes there's, there's real progress that can happen uh, that there, there are new forms of international cooperation that can emerge in a relatively short period of time. And so I think it's, it's you know, just very important to inform the, the policy discussion in particular about these issues. And it, it means that when there's the political will to do something, real change can, can happen. That being said, it would be a bit naive to, to believe that the very same bankers who've been helping their clients evade taxes for years or even decades all of a sudden or perfectly, truthfully, honestly cooperating with all the world's tax authorities. And so the evidence is limited, but there is clearly evidence that some significant non-compliance uh, remains uh, for uh, a variety of reasons. But that's, that's the good. So we've made progress on that issue. Let me just emphasize that it's just one very specific form of tax evasion that the fact that there is less of that form of tax evasion doesn't imply that tax evasion by the rich overall has declined. And in fact, I'll show you evidence later that, that this is not the case. Okay, so now the bad. The bad is the, the lack of progress on the issue of uh, tax evasion by multinational companies, corporate profit shifting to tax havens, uh, uh, which is just the uh, the fact that multinational firms book profits in low tax countries above and beyond what can be explained by their activity, by their presence in, in those countries. According to the estimates that we have, it's essentially based on, on work that I conducted a few years ago with Thomas Torsloff and Ludwig Vier, uh, and, uh, and that we uh, uh, updated with Idan, who's here uh, for, the, for the report. Uh, 
in the 1970s, early 1980s, profit shifting to tax havens was not a big issue. The loss of corporate tax revenue was really negligible. Then there was a huge increase uh, in the 90s, 2000s, early 2010s, and then some stabilization at a high level. So today, uh, we estimate that uh, profit shifting to tax havens uh, reduces uh, global corporate tax revenues by the equivalent of 10% of the amount of corporate tax revenues uh, collected. You can see that this has stabilized since 2015 um, uh, in the context of important policy initiatives, uh, the base erosion and profit shifting initiative of the OECD, BEPS, the US tax reform of 2018, which introduced a number of measures to limit profit shifting by multinational companies and also a big tax cut. Um, so there are two, two takeaways, you know, of course it's very, from that graph, you cannot say anything about the causal effect of those policies. What you can say is, you know, perhaps absent those policies, perhaps, uh, you know, the line would have kept growing. So maybe those policies had an effect. Uh, but in any case, what you can say for sure is that they have not been enough to reduce profit shifting and so that the problem very much is still here. Now, there was high hope, uh, high hopes in 2021 when 100, 140 countries and territories agreed on a 15% minimum tax on the profits of multinational companies. Uh, why high hopes? Because it was really a groundbreaking agreement, a historical achievement. It was the first time that countries agreed on a minimum tax rate, something that was deemed completely utopian 10 years ago. And, uh, and, and now it's a reality. It's going to be implemented in the European Union starting next year and a number of other uh, countries like the UK or, or Japan. Many countries uh, next year and in 2025 are going to start implementing that agreement. So it's really a landmark achievement. At the same time, already in 2021, you had uh, one big problem, which was that the rate was quite low, 15%. You know, typically corporate tax rates in most countries are significantly above 15%. In France, for instance, 20, 25%, which means that regular, you know, mom and pop uh, uh, shops pay 25%. Uh, and the notion that multinational companies should be allowed to pay significantly less than that was already a bit weird. But at least there was the promise that even if the rate was quite low, 15%, at least it would be applied comprehensively. Okay. Now, problem. What has happened since then is that there has been a, a, a proliferation of exemptions and loopholes that have very significantly reduced uh, uh, the scope of the agreement and weakened uh, uh, the agreement. So it's been watered down. What, what are the main problems? Uh, the main conceptual or even philosophical problem is the carve-out for substance. The carve-out for substance means that if a company has substance, meaning real activity in a country, it can exclude the corresponding profits from the base of the minimum tax. What this means is that uh, the more production you move to a tax haven, the lower your tax rate will be with no floor. If you move enough production, if you have enough employment, if you have enough capital in a very low tax place, then your tax rate can be you know, 5%, 2%. There's no floor. It could be as little as 0%. Um, it's a big problem because it uh, uh, gives firms incentives to move production to uh, very low uh, tax places. Um, and so it's going to exacerbate uh, international uh, tax competition. So that's one thing. So we propose an estimate of the cost of that here. It's a purely static estimate. So assuming that firms don't move more activity than they currently have in tax havens, so it's very conservative. From a purely static perspective, it reduces revenues you know, by that amount. Okay, so that's one thing. Second problem, which in fact, the more I think about it, the more I, 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 I tend to think that this might actually be the biggest practical issue. The biggest practical issue might be this issue of tax credits. 
tax credits, what's, what's the problem? Well, we have a minimum tax of 15%. The question is what counts as a tax? Initially, again, there was the idea that 15% would be applied very comprehensively. But now in the current agreement, tax credits are not counted as a reduction in taxes paid. So think about it. What this means is that traditionally, the way that countries competed for, for uh, profits and activity was by cutting the statutory corporate tax rate. And some countries had zero rates, like Bermuda. Now, what is Bermuda going to do in the future? What they, what they could do, and they've already signaled that they were moving in that direction, they, they, they are going to do something like, OK, we're going to introduce some corporate income tax, maybe 8%. Don't have to, they don't have to go all the way to 15 because of the substance carve out or what. In any case, they can choose whatever rate they want. They said they signaled that maybe they would pick 8%. But at the same time, they are going to offer tax credits to companies to essentially offset the 8% tax. So that at the end of the day, you know, if you take eight and you reimburse eight, you know, the rate tax rate is zero. But from the perspective of the pillar two of the pillar two agreement of the 15% global minimum tax, you know, the tax credits are not counted as a reduction in taxes paid. It's a critical problem. It's really a major, major uh, uh, issue. Again, here we're very, being very conservative in the way that we model the the cost of that provision, in the extreme, it could totally destroy, in fact, the global minimum tax. If we move, if countries systematically do what I just described in the case of Bermuda, completely offset the minimum tax by refundable tax credits that are eligible for that treatment, then uh, it totally uh, destroys the global minimum tax. And tax competition just changes a little bit in nature. Instead of competing on tax rates, countries compete by offering tax credits. But e economically, this is just the same thing. OK, there's also an exemption for US multinationals. It's not exactly for US multinationals, but essentially the domestic profits of US uh, multinational companies, which initially were supposed to be subject to the 15% minimum tax, for the moment are not going to be subject to that minimum tax. The US has not ratified uh, Pillar 2, uh, was not able to ratify Pillar 2, even when uh, uh, the Democratic Party controlled both the, the executive branch and uh, Congress. Now that the House of Representatives is under Republican control, there's absolutely no chance of any ratification uh, in, in, in that uh, Congress. And there, there is. Uh, a long history of uh, of the U.S. Uh, agreeing in principle on some international agreements like the Kyoto uh, Agreement, and then never ratifying uh, those uh, agreements because of uh, opposition in Congress. And so there is a real risk that the U.S. will not uh, apply uh, uh, the global minimum tax, at least for the foreseeable future. Okay, let me just skip that and let me get, so that was the bad, but now there is the ugly. And this is the ugly. The ugly is uh, the fact that uh, the wealthiest people uh, on the planet have a very big tax deficit. That, that means they have very low effective uh, tax rates, typically much lower than the tax rates of other groups of the population. And this is again, uh, uh, an area where the evidence is not fully comprehensive, but there's been a lot of progress in recent years in uh, assembling statistics on, on that uh, issue. Here in the report, we include series for three countries, the US, Netherlands, and France. There's actually a study that was released yesterday for Italy that shows something very close to France. Um, and there are different ways to measure the problem, but one way is to compute tax rates as a, as, a, as a fraction of income with a consistent, comprehensive notion of income. This is what the graph shows here. Or you can compute tax rates you know, relative to other uh, uh, denominators, you know, relative to wealth. It doesn't really make a difference for the point that, that we make here, which is that when you look at billionaires and you look at the personal tax payments of billionaires, the individual income tax they pay and any wealth tax they pay in the countries that have a wealth tax like Norway. So when you take their total personal tax payments and you divide that either by their income or by their wealth, 
it's just very, very low. You know, and you don't even have to divide by anything to realize it's very low. You look, for instance, at the uh, in the U.S. in 2021, the leaks by the U.S. media, uh, the revelations by the U.S. media, ProPublica, and the taxes paid by U.S. billionaires, and you see, you know, people like Jeff Bezos paying essentially zero uh, income tax, Elon Musk essentially most years paying uh, zero income tax. So, you know, then you can divide zero by wealth, by income, by whatever you want, it's going to be zero. What, here it's not zero because in those graphs, all taxes are included, not only uh, personal taxes, but also corporate taxes, consumption taxes, everything. And so when you take into account all taxes collected at all levels of government, well, you see that in all countries, all groups of the population pay a lot of taxes, right? Because just we, in, especially in high income uh, uh, countries, collect a lot of taxes. You know, the tax to national income ratio in France is 50%. So unsurprisingly, almost all the groups of the population pay more or less 50% of their income in taxes. That has to be the case. You know, the money has to come from, from somewhere. Uh, in the US, the, the, the tax take is lower, and so ju just tax rates are lower across the board. But in all cases, and, and the Netherlands is kind of in between the US and, and France in terms of the, the overall size of taxation. But in all cases, all social groups pay a lot of tax, and then you have this pretty dramatic regressivity towards the top of the distribution. Um, if you just focus on the personal taxes of billionaires and you express that as a fraction of wealth, what, what we find in the report is that billionaires pay the equivalent of zero to 0.5% 0 of their wealth in personal taxes each year. And that's their tax rate, their effective tax rate, expressed as a fraction of wealth. Hence, the main proposal that we make in the report, which is to introduce a global minimum tax on uh, billionaires equal to 2% of their wealth. Okay, so it's the main policy recommendation we make. And indeed in the, in the global media coverage of the report, it's in most cases, the, 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 the thing that was emphasized that was uh, outlined by journalists, this call for 2% global minimum tax on billionaires. Um, what does it mean very concretely? So you have less than 3000 billionaires globally uh, so it's very, very, very small number of individuals that you're going to tax. And you might say, well, we don't care, you know, 3,000 people in our planet with 7 billion individuals. Why are we talking, why are we even talking about that? Well, that's because they have $13 trillion in wealth, okay? So that's potentially here a pretty large tax base. And not only do they have $13 trillion in wealth, they don't pay a lot, they pay in tax today, they pay 44 billion in, in, in individual income and wealth taxes. So hence the very low 0 0.2, 0 0.3% effective tax rate as a fraction of wealth. And so if you tax, if you say, well, at the minimum, they should pay 2% uh, of their wealth in tax, then they would pay 2% times the 13 trillion minus the 44 billion they already pay. And that gets you more than $200 billion in additional tax revenue globally, just from that tiny population that really doesn't pay a lot today. So it's almost like a, a, a free lunch. You know, they are, they are super rich, they pay super little, and you get, you get you know, $214 billion. And you might say, well, it's completely impossible. What is this idea of a global coordinated minimum tax? Well, except we know as a fact that global coordinated minimum taxes exist because we've just done it for multinational companies. And you might say, well, but you've just told us that uh, the, the minimum tax for multinational companies is not working very well, it's full of loopholes and stuff. Well, yes, so that's why we are talking about that and we are trying to be very clear about how it should be designed, how it should be structured if we want this new global minimum tax to work. And the most important aspect is uh, that it should be expressed as a fraction of wealth. The critical mistake would be to express it as a function of income or something else. Why? Because for billionaires, the notion of income is not very well defined, or even the notion of consumption is not very well defined. When you're very rich, it's very easy to structure your wealth in such a way that the wealth is going to generate very little income or sometimes zero. Also, a lot of the change in the wealth of billionaires come from 
uh, the appreciation of their stocks. So it's you know valuation gains. It's not conventionally defined income. Anyway, long story short, for very rich people, income is a fuzzy no notion. So you don't want to base a tax on income. But wealth is well defined. If you are a billionaire, that's nine zeros. That means the total market value of your assets minus debts is more than one billion, whatever you want. Uh, uh, Croner, let's say. So we have a bigger uh, population of billionaires. Um, uh, in any case, it's well defined. And so uh, if we were to move in that direction, I think it would be really important to have a, a minimum tax expressed as a fraction of wealth. We propose 2% of wealth. You know, obviously, it's not for us to say what the rate should be. 2% just to give a sense of whether this is big or small. The, the wealth of global billionaires on average has grown 7% a year uh, since 1990s. So on average, each year it grows 7%. They are paying 0 to 0.5% 0 of their wealth in taxes each year. So it makes essentially no difference to the, to the growth of their wealth. And we are saying there should be a tax of at least 2%. So it would reduce the growth rate of their wealth from 7% down to 5%. For comparison, average wealth per adult globally has grown about 3% per year since the 1990s. So if billionaire wealth was still growing 5% a year, it means that with this 2% minimum tax, it's not that you reduce inequality. It's not even that you stabilize wealth inequality. It's just you reduce the pace of the increase of wealth inequality. So it's not the, the communist revolution yet. It's pretty, uh, you know, <laughs> reasonable, let's say. But what's important is that even with this low rate of 2%, you get quite a lot of uh, revenue. How much exactly? Well, you know, the billion dollar numbers don't make a lot of sense uh, by themselves. I think the comparison that perhaps makes most sense is, is the following. You tax billionaires with a 2% minimum tax, you can get almost 250 billion. So these are numbers for 2021. If you update those to 2023, you get $250 billion from billionaires. If you strengthen the global minimum tax on multinational companies by getting back to the original the spirit of 2020, 2021, 20% minimum tax rate, no loopholes, you get an extra $250 billion in revenue. So now you combine the two, 250 plus 250 equals $500 billion with two modest minimum taxes on billionaires and multinationals, you get $500 billion, which is what is uh, what the best estimates uh, say that uh, developing countries need in additional tax revenue to, uh, to face the challenges of climate change. Okay, so we think that globally, developing countries need an extra $500 billion in tax revenue. We can get to that with just two modest, coordinated global minimum taxes. And you're going to say, and uh, I'll, st I'll stop with that before concluding, you'll say, well, okay, how do we get there? Uh, multinationals already, though there was hopes, and then it you know, the agreement was watered down. Billionaires, obviously, they're few in number, but they're quite powerful. So isn't all of that uh, hopeless? Uh, yes and no. So we're not going to get there if we start from the premise that there has to be a global agreement. If we make consensus the starting point, the prerequisite, then it's going to fail. Why? Because if you make consensus the prerequisite for any global agreement, in effect, you give a veto power to tax havens. And that's how you end up with weak agreements, such as the weakened minimum tax on multinational companies. But there's another way to proceed, which is to start not from global agreements, but to start with unilateral measures by some countries. So it could be just one country or a group of countries. And such unilateral measures can pave the way, ultimately, for global agreements. That's exactly what happened with uh, the automatic exchange of bank information, which started originally uh, with unilateral action by the US under the Obama presidency in 2009, when they unilaterally implemented the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, forced Swiss banks and banks in other tax havens to exchange information with the US. 
And then other countries said, oh, look, you, you give data to the US, why don't you give us data as well? And that's how unilateral action in the end paved the way for a global agreement. And you can do the same, uh, we think. Uh, you can generalize that approach with the taxation of multinational companies and with the taxation of billionaires as well. Okay, let me just conclude by so that maybe we have still a bit of time for questions by saying that the, the main takeaway is to understand that tax evasion is not a law of nature. It's a policy choice. Some policies have been effective, like the automatic exchange of bank information. Others are falling short. Some issues remain wholly unaddressed. And uh, we're all big fans of international cooperation, but you have to do it smartly, uh, not make it the starting point, but have international coordination as the end point. In the meantime, any country can play the role of tax collector of last resort, meaning collect the minimum taxes that other countries choose not to collect. And that's how you can move from originally what can be unilateral action by some countries to eventually <coughs> uh, cooperative uh, uh, equilibria and global, uh, global agreements. Uh, this is uh, this is key, we think, to uh, to uh, uh, change the dynamic of global tax competition and more broadly to reconcile globalization with tax justice. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriel. Is this working now? Yes. Oh, phew. So this is, uh, thank you for this very interesting presentation. And we have members here, both from the Norwegian Ministry of Finance. I will not put you on the spot now to hear when you're going to implement this, but we also have from the Norwegian Tax Administration, who I know have benefited from your research in like changing the way they uh, approach uh, foreign uh, offshore wealth. We have time for some questions. If there are anybody online who wants to just write it in the chat and we'll follow up, but are there any questions here? Uh, I guess the journalists want to talk you in alone, but if you have the journalists have anything here as well in the plenum they want to say, but questions? Matt? Gabriel, how do we think about collecting taxes from billionaires in states where their wealth is possibly the wealth of the state itself? So Saudi Arabia, Russia, oligarchs, members of long reigning families in sub-Saharan Africa, where these states have very low interest in collecting them, uh, taxes themselves, but may be willing to shield their billionaires from a collector of last resort. How would we deal with that problem? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, look, here's the way I, I think about that. So <clears throat> if, uh, if a country wanted to implement a, a billionaire minimum tax alone, unilaterally, here is how that country should proceed. First of all, it, it should tax its own billionaires, but it shouldn't stop there. It's important to say, okay, we're going to tax our billionaires, but also foreign billionaires, we're going to tax them at least a little bit. So how exactly and, and, and why? So foreign billionaires, you're going to tax them to the extent that part of their wealth derives from uh, companies that have access to your market. So in your example, uh, you know, if, if uh, some, some uh, uh, natural resources or oil companies are controlled by, uh, by specific billionaires abroad and part of their revenues come from selling oil to, I don't, to France, let's say, let's say France is the, the first mover and wants to tax global billionaires. So some of the oil is, sent, is, is, is sold to, to French customers. Then France would say, look, we estimate that part of your wealth derives, and that's true, derives from having access to the French market. Maybe 10% of the sales of the companies that you control uh, are made in France. In that case, we can say that 10% of your wealth, in fact, ultimately derives from having access to the French market. And so we're going to collect 10% of your tax deficit. So that's how you can do it. And that's how um, uh, there, are, there are rules like that 
in the, in the global minimum tax for multinational companies. Complicated rules, you know, known as the under tax payment rules, but mechanisms like that where what's important to understand is the philosophy. The philosophy is that if some actors have been uh, taxed too little abroad, then you need some countries to step in and collect the taxes that other countries have chosen not to collect. And you can generalize that approach. You can do it for com multinational companies, but you can do it for, for wealth as well. And the way to make it work well is to tie this to the notion, as I was explaining, that you know, profits and wealth, deep down, they originate from the fact that you have access to certain markets. So the, these, these market countries uh, can play the role of tax collector of last resort. Uh, my question is related to the unrealized capital gains because wealthy people usually have most of their prof most of their wealth maybe in this type of uh, wealth class. Mm -hmm. So, what what do you have to say about it? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so, in in the report, we don't talk a lot about that. So, we just say there should be a tax expressed as wealth, not unrealized gains or anything. Um, an, an, an alternative to that would be to, to have a tax, the, a minimum tax expressed as a fraction of, uh, of income broadly construed to include any unrealized capital gains. That's the, the billionaire minimum income tax that, that's, uh, that was proposed by, uh, by Joe Biden in the US and that, that actually he put in his budget. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it, it, it makes sense conceptu conceptually. The main, let's say the main limitation is that it's not totally clear why you would only want to tax people with unrealized gains and not like billionaires with no gains. So you, you have, essentially you have two types of billionaires. You have billionaires like who are on an explosive wealth growth trajectory, right? Like their business is is booming and their wealth doubles every year. Okay, so they have a lot of unrealized gains and those would pay a lot of tax with a tax based on unrealized gains. And then you have, you know, like more mature billionaires. I, you know, I don't know, like say the Walmart family in the US, where the wealth is more like stable. And there's not a lot of unrealized gains. And it's not clear why you would want to tax just the first type, but not the other type. I think it's a bit more logical to say, if you're super rich, whatever the path, whatever the trajectory of your wealth, but if you're super rich and you're not paying a lot currently, then you have to pay at least 2%. My question is about the role of the US now. Um, it seems we can get global tax enforcement done when the US leads the way. You gave the example of the good, right? FATCA and then the CRS. Uh, the situation seemed quite different for the global minimum tax, where it seems like everyone uh, undermined the standard a little bit uh, because the U.S. was asking for it, after which the U.S. said, sorry, no, we're not joining anyways. Um, and so my question is, you know, we don't really have a working example yet how global tax enforcement works against the interests of the U.S. And um, so, you know, you gave us hope that it might work unilaterally. But there are other options, right? There's the EU, there's the OCD, there's the UN, there are all kinds of initiatives. So, you know, what's the best way to go around it? Should we really only work country by country or? I think that's a great question. And I, I, I think there is at least one example of unilateral action that, that didn't originate from the US and that led to some global agreement, which is the case of digital service taxes that were implemented unilaterally by a number of uh, EU countries around 2018, 2019, and that actually played a key role in reviving the discussions at the OECD about the global minimum tax. So you can view those digital service taxes as you know, unilateral measures that they are not, they didn't cause you know, fully the agreement, but they played a role. And, and conceptually, there's absolutely no reason why the first mover should be the US. You know, it's important to understand that any country can play this role of, 
of tax collector of last resort, as, as we uh, were discussing with Matt in the case of wealth, but you can do it for multinational as well. Any country, no matter the size. So if you are a small country, you know, a small country, and you want to better tax multinational companies, and you account for, let's say, just 1% of the sales of global multinationals, and you're, you're going to collect in the system that we describe in the report, you're going to collect just 1% of the, the tax deficit of these multinationals. So it's not a lot of money for those firms. So they don't really have a reason to leave that country, to abandon that market, but it can be a lot of tax revenue for that one country that collects 1% of the tax deficit of multinational companies. And what's important is to have one, you need one brave country to start and, and, uh, uh, and, and it doesn't have to be a big country, even a small country can start. And if one small country and everywhere I, I discuss these ideas, I, I always tell people, you, you, the Norwegians, you could be the first, you know, do it. And, and, and any country could do this and then it can start a, a kind of race to the top. Because imagine that, okay, next year, Norway says, look, we are going to collect our share of the tax deficit of multinational companies and billionaires. It's going to be a small share because we are a small market relative to multinationals and, and, and billionaires globally. But let's say they do this, okay, Norway collects a bit of tax revenue, then other countries I think would be very interested because they will, they will see, oh wow, Norway did it. There was some money here on the table for countries to grab and the brave Norwegian people, they grab their share and now it's our turn. We're going to grab our share. Why not? You know, these, these companies and these billionaires have a tax deficit. Let's grab our share of the deficit. And then, you know, you see that as soon as you have sufficiently many countries that do that, it would become pointless for, for firms to book profits in low tax places because the, 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 the reduction in taxes paid would be offset by higher taxes owed in the destination market countries. And so in turn, it would become pointless for, for tax havens to offer low tax rates. So you would see tax havens increase their corporate tax rate or introduce a, a, a billionaire minimum tax to collect their share of the tax deficit. And so you see how with unilateral action, even starting with a small country, just one, you can create a process that uh, that really changes the face of globalization because it replaces the race to the bottom by a race to the top. You start from unilateral measures and you end it, you end up with ultimately some coordination on high minimum taxes. Norway, do it. <laughs> okay. Uh... So you mentioned the need for an independent group of experts to assess the dynamics of taxation on a global scale, like the IPCC of, for climate change. Like my question was, could you please elaborate on the practical steps and challenges that in, in establishing such a global authority, especially in a world where international cooperation, especially on taxation is very complex and politically charged. Great question. Uh, let me first elaborate a little bit on the, on why we need that and why what we have at the moment uh, is not enough. So we don't have an international organization that uh, uh, looks at taxation and tax harmonization, tax co cooperation from a truly global perspective. The organization that comes the closest to that is the OECD, but the OECD represents only 38 high income countries, it's just a small fraction of the world population. The global South is not represented. The OECD, it's true, has created an inclusive framework where you know, they uh, uh, include more countries, but in, in, you know, practically uh, it's, it's slightly provocative, but I think it, it summarizes the reality quite well that this inclusive framework is really inclusive for tax havens much more than for big uh, global South countries. And indeed, when you talk to policymakers in, in uh, Brazil or in uh, South Africa or in India, they are very, very upset and rightly so about both the outcome of the two pillar uh, process and, and the process itself. And they feel rightly that their interests and they are not represented and their voice is not heard. And look, 
that it's it's not to criticize the OECD. It's it, it, that's their DNA. Their job, their mission is thirty. We represent thirty eight high income countries. It's not a global uh, organization. So you know they're they're just it's they're just fulfilling their mission, but that just illustrates the need for something else. Um, and there's uh, the, that's the context in which there's growing demand for the UN to become more involved in uh, in in those questions, which you know has would have lot, lots of positive uh, aspects uh, because the US represents uh, you know, almost all the world's uh, countries. Um, uh, but practically, I think the way one way this could materialize is you know originally the UN created the IPCC, and maybe that's the way to go. Maybe the UN should create something like the IPCC, but for taxation, where you know there would be the the the, the, the point would be really to 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 found all of this on frontier research from a truly global uh, from a truly global perspective second to last question uh, yeah i had a real i had a related question um uh mainly pertaining to framing and political momentum uh i thought the i thought this the presentation of the hypothetical sums to be collected to be really interesting because they're large in some respects but in other respects by all consideration they're not uh, they're not they're not humongous, and you could think that other that governments have other tax instruments to raise comparable sums. Do you think, in terms of like framing and political momentum, political momentum, it's really an issue of uh, of demonstrating that this is also a tax about inequality and <clears throat> and about tackling the negative effects of inequality just as much as raising revenues. It's a good question. I think as. A I, I think to be honest that a two percent global minimum tax on billionaires is not going to address inequality. I tried to illustrate that with the numbers, right? So if billionaire wealth is growing seven percent, you reduce that by two points, it's going to grow by five percent a year, which is still more than average wealth growth for the average adult in the world. And so in fact, inequality would keep rising if past trends continue, even with that tax. So I want to be very, very clear about that. This is not the type of tax and same for 20% minimum corporate tax. These are low rates. These are minimum tax rates. These are very specific instruments. This is a very limited, small population of taxpayers. This is just wholly insufficient to make a significant difference to global inequality. I think it would go in the right direction. It would reduce it, but uh, it, 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 it could not, Cannot be seen as uh, uh, as enough to uh, to to addressing the rise of global uh, the, the rise of inequality within many countries, um, but it's necessary. Okay, it's necessary for basic fairness issues to try to limit some of that you know regressivity here. It's uh, necessary for basic. Uh, uh, revenue considerations. Again, if we if developing countries need half a trillion to fight climate change, we can get to half a trillion with those two instruments. So it's it's a bare minimum. We, we need that as you know as to start with. It's not every you know it's not the end point. So I'll end this discussion by uh, bringing the discussion back home here to Norway. So we have. We are seeing an increasing competition about wealthy individuals, like high net, like ta taxable individuals. So, so instead of moving your money now to Switzerland, people from Norway move themselves to reduce their taxes because we have a wealth tax. So there's a high, what creates many big newspaper headlines here is like rich individuals moving to Switzerland and stop paying taxes to Norway from day one. And that's kind of also a threat to the legit legitimacy of the tax system and the wealth tax. So. What, like now we have the Minister of Finance here and the, tax, um, and the tax administration. So what should they do to fix that? Ah, this. <laughs> uh, where is it? Uh, this one. The number, <laughs> point number one. So there is a solution to that. Uh, thank you, Annette. Great question. There is a solution uh, to that uh, problem, which is really important to understand. 
so at the moment, what what uh, the way that that countries deal with this issue of wealthy people moving abroad to avoid taxes, you have two polar cases. You have the case of the US, where taxation is based on citizenship, meaning if you were born in the US, so you have US citizenship and you move at age two months, your, parent, your parents move, and then you never set foot again in the US, well, you still have to pay taxes in the US until you die. That's one case. And then the, there's what almost all other countries do, which is that if you've been a tax resident for a very, very long time, 70 years in, uh, in France, let's say, and then you dis and you've become very rich there, and then you decide to move to Switzerland, then immediately France stops taxing you. That's the opposite extreme. And these two extreme cases are too extreme, but you can do many other things in between. And that's what we explain in the report. What you can do is you can say, look, if you've been a long-term tax resident in a given country, no matter your citizenship, you know, put nationality outside of, of this, it's irrelevant. What matters is you've been a tax resident for a long time in a country, number one. And then number two, you've become very rich in that country. And you can define, you can discuss what this means, but you've become rich. And number three, you move to a lot, you decide to move to a low tax country. That's your right, you know, freedom of movement, no problem. But if those three conditions uh, are met, then you should keep paying taxes in your origin country for some years, for a number of years. Maybe not until you die, like in the US case, but it could be five years, could be 10 years, could be 15 years. It's very simple. And in fact, in Norway, there's already, from my discussions with, with Annette uh, of these issues and my understanding of the Norwegian law, in the basic tax law, there are, or, there's already something like that that says that if you've been a tax resident for 10 years in Norway, and then you move, uh, out of Norway, in principle, you're supposed to keep paying taxes in Norway for three years, except that those rules are over, overruled by bilateral tax treaties that, that weaken uh, their uh, application. So what Norway can do is just get back to the spirit of the normal rule, which is good. It's a really important and, 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 and good idea and systematize it, you know, why only uh, Paying, uh, you know, asking people to keep paying for three years could be more. Uh, if you've been a very a tax resident in Norway for 50 years and you've become enormously rich in Norway, then maybe taxes could should follow you for 10, 15, 20 years. So just make it more systematic, no exemptions, and it would just completely change this whole debate about uh, international tax competition, the risk of of rich people moving abroad, because you know it would make it pointless or almost pointless for very wealthy people to move to Switzerland for tax reasons. It's a great illustration of this, you know, of, of, of this idea that tax evasion is not a law of nature. Tax competition is not a law of nature. We can tolerate these phenomena. We can even encourage them, exacerbate them, just like we can make uh, other choices. And let me just finish on that. It's, it's really, it's a very simple idea. And so you might think, oh, you know, why, why haven't countries already done that with, with the exception of Norway? Essentially, almost no country or very few countries uh, have uh, uh, provisions like that. And I think the main reason why it has not been done a lot in the past is because uh, uh, policymakers felt that they could not enforce a tax on non-residents well. But that has really changed since the automatic exchange of bank information. So now there is information about the income and the wealth and the assets of non-residents that countries could use to enforce such a tax on, uh, on, on, on rich people uh, moving to tax havens. So my prediction is that because this is such a compelling idea and it's technically feasible that this will actually happen. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's in three years or in 10 years, but I, it's the most logical system. Thank you, Gabriel. Then it's just up to the tax administration to enforce the rules we actually have in place. That's it, right? So uh, thank you so much for this uh, very great uh, keynote. You. And then we will continue the discussion on the economics in one and a half hours. So just follow us in the bus who are here. And then we will have the investor view as well. So see you then. Thank you. Thank you.